Great. Awesome. Thank you for recording. Um, so before we like hop into anything, I just kind of wanted to get um, to know you guys a little bit better. So um, I want you to uh, go ahead in the chat. Um, I've got it up on my screen. Just tell me something that you are really proud of, something that you did recently that you're really proud of um, and why you're proud of it. I just kind of want to get to know you guys a little bit better. See what pops up. All right. I'm from Philadelphia and we're so proud of everything right now. I love that. That's great. I've never been to Philadelphia before. Yes, submitted an NSF grant. Awesome. Hi, Bella. I just presented on accessibility at the Lesbians Who Tech Summit. I like really wanted to go to that. I saw that on Twitter and then like I was just bad at time. And I was like, thought it was 30 minutes later and I was really kicking myself, but I'm really happy to see you here. Um, great. Paper has just been published within less than six months. That is really an accomplishment. Awesome. From Auto, I started a certificate in learning design. Hi, Maha. We're in the same class together. Cool. Having a pool installed today. That's pretty exciting. All right, having presentations at AECT. Okay, great, this is so cool. I'm glad that gotten to know you guys a little bit better. Um, so next, I think I would like to um, kind of just give you guys an example of what it's actually like to be a user of an inaccessible website, um, just so you can kind of get an understanding of what it is that we're trying to you know, solve for um, that kind of thing. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, just give me just a moment to do that. Okay, I'm gonna share my sound. If anything's not working, like someone just like shout out at me. Um, okay, great. So we're just gonna play this as just a short clip. Are started. Finished. Jaws cursor. A. Cycling of nutrients. What do we call the acellus resources? Acellus. What do we call the acellus resources? Cycling of nutrients. Through an ecosystem, acellus help. A. Biogeochemical cycles. B. Energy cycles. Virtual PC. A. Heading A. Library. Enter. Heading level six. Okay. I'm going to stop there for a second, maybe to explain a little bit about what you just saw. Um, but what you just saw was. Um, uh, uh, a user was answering a biology quiz online, um, and unfortunately, the question was an image and not actual text in there. So they actually had to run OCR technology over that image to understand what the question was. Um, OCR is optical character recognition, and it basically converts images of typed or written um, words into uh, like machine encoded text. This is not a feature that's really supposed to be used for this purchase for this purpose. But um, as you can see, like the user probably didn't have any other alternative. And even when they did that, the text, like the way it was read was not really very understandable anyway. So let's see another example. Heading level three, what is the main difference? Between okay. okay, I am now on an accessible question and this accessible question, the thing that makes it accessible is it actually is readable. So, like, JAWS can read it, and it's not pictures of text, it's actual text. So, I'm going to give you an example. Heading level 6, biogeochemical cycles. Heading level 3, what is the main difference between nutrients and energy? Heading level 5, uh, nutrients are lost in the form of heat. Heading level 5, B, energy can be recycled. Heading level 5, C, nutrients can be recycled. Heading level 5, D, energy is gained in the form of heat. Next graphic. So, basically... I can choose one of those and it's actually going to, you know, work and it gives me the choices and I can read them just fine. So that's an example of an accessible question and you're just going to see how much faster I can answer this question. 
Heading level 3, what is the main difference between nutrients and energy? Heading level 5, uh, nutrients are lost in the form of heat. Heading level 5, B, energy can be recycled. Heading level 5, C, nutrients can be recycled. Heading level 5, D, energy is gained in the form of heading level center. Heading level 3, along so the way. I was able to answer that with no OCRing, no screen capturing, no downloading HTML files. It's just easy, easy. And not that the question's easy, just that it's easy for me to get to the question because it's so silly and just sad that on those other questions, I have to do all these OCR things. So that. Is all right. So that was a pretty cool kind of like before, you know, an, ex an after example. But what I love that she said is just easy, easy, easy. Right. And that's what our job is, essentially, as you know, whether you're a learning designer, UX designer, developer, whatever. Um, our job is to make things easy so that um, users can do what they need to do to move on with their lives. Um, <coughs> let me just scooch back over to our presentation and we can kind of get into this. So um, I just want to take a second to clarify what we mean when we're actually talking about disability. Um, so our understanding and perception of disability has changed pretty dramatically. Um, in the past, even in the past quarter century. In uh, 1980, the World Health Organization understood disability as a personal attribute. So in their words, in the context of a health experience, a disability is any restriction or lack of ability resulting from an impairment to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. Um, I want to like just call out like that usage of the word normal is not something that anyone should be saying today. Um, it's ableist language. Nobody is normal. Abs like humans, you know, as I'm sure many like if our UX uh, researchers here know, humans are unpredictable and wildly diverse. Um, and that's not really an accurate representation of humanity. So today, um, our definition is a little bit better. Um, disability is context dependent. So disability is not just a health problem. It is a complex phenomenon reflecting in the interaction between features of a person's body um, and the features of the society in which they live. So um, it's just a mismatch. It's not the person's problem. It's the design's problem. Um, and that's how I see our roles of as designers in this is that, you know, there's uh, someone's trying to do something, there is a gap in how they do it, and we're supposed to be solving for that gap. Um, you may have heard of the term, um, like, with accessibility, there's like human centered design, there's inclusive design. Um, and you may be a little confused about what that means. Um, but Inclusive design is an approach, but accessibility is an outcome. Along with like uh, us usability, I would say, is an outcome of uh, inclusive design as well. So this Venn Ven Ven diagram shows that like within the larger circle of human-centered design and inclusive design, you know, we have these overlapping areas of uh, accessibility and usability. Within uh, inclusive design, there are uh, three principles that we follow. One is that um, recognize that people are excluded from all kinds of experiences and have been for centuries, millennia, and that has been by design. Um, there's a great uh, quote from um, someone I follow on Twitter, Antoinette Carroll, that's um, systems of oppression are by design and therefore they can and they must be redesigned. Um, and that's also like our how I see our role as designers when we're taking this inclusive design approach. We are very slowly, you know, it's not that this is an easy thing, but we are very slowly and very incrementally um, kind of redesigning some of these systems um, for the better to include um, the whole of humanity, essentially. The, um, the other principle is learning from diversity. So, um, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but, you know, I'm glad you're all here at this talk, but like I mentioned, like I am not, um, I do not live with any disabilities, maybe one day I will, um, 
But my perspective is as a design professional working in organizations, how to um, integrate, you know, accessibility best practices into your design and development process, how to advocate it for in your organization. Um, but I am not someone to ask about, you know, you know, how do, you know, blind people do this or how does a, a deaf person do that? Um, you should be really going out and seeking um, out these voices proactively. Um, and they are, you know, the disability community are very vocal um, about sharing their experiences, how they use technology, and even just, you know, Googling things online, you can really learn a lot. Um, and I will be linking um, a, a doc of um, uh, resources that has um, a bunch of people to, to follow um, just so that you can, you know, learn more about um, some of these intersections in the world. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it for that one. And then um, lastly is um, solve for one, extend to many. So uh, this is a this is a great graphic. Um, that has been amended from a very popular image um, created by Microsoft has a, an inclusive design kit. Um, but this one is has a little bit more included because um, it kind of takes into account disabilities that are also covered by accessibility law. Um, so at the top, we have like um, some of the five different senses, touch, see, hear, speak, and cognitive. And then it lists out um, uh, examples of like a permanent disability and then uh, kind of like temporary or situational um, aspects of that. And this graphic is not saying that, you know, somebody who is carrying a baby or a computer experiences the same thing as a person with one arm. But what this is saying is that when you design for, um, you know, people with those permanent disabilities, like they have one arm, they're blind, deaf, nonverbal, or ADHD, um, then uh, those, you know, situations, temporary and situational, um, are also going to see those additional benefits as well. So, um, you know, kind of thinking about, like, how can we, um, you know, design for, you know, uh, you know, uh, someone who might have just, you know, cataracts or just be working outside in the sun on their laptop. How can we make that color contrast in your screen easy to read? Um, or maybe on the cognitive side, like how might we, um, you know, uh, help our users like focus a little bit more and not overstimulate them um, for, you know, someone with ADHD, but also if you are, um, have depression or fatigue, um, or just in a really, you know, crowded, like open office environment. Um, so kind of like thinking for, you know, one set of users and everyone else is going to benefit from that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of really detailed, requirements and exceptions and rules and regulations in terms of web accessibility in the law. And I'm not going to go through all of those, but I will just say this. Um, web accessibility is the letter of the law. It is required by the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and also the AODA in Canada, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, and the way that we kind of like measure this and set these standards is something you may have heard um, of WCAG, which is the Web Accessibility Content Guidelines. Um, and it's kind of broken into um, like four principles and then 12 guidelines. Um, and we'll kind of like go into those requirements um, and guidelines in a little bit with some examples. But um, just as far as like what you're required for the ADA, um, there are several versions of um, WCAG. There was 2.0, there's 2.1 that came out a couple of years ago. There's, um, I think there's a 3.0 that's like in its first draft right now. So, um, but for ADA it's 2.1 and then also AA, there are basically like three like levels of compliance. Um, I don't know why we have like single A if double A is like what is required by the law, but you know, that's uh, that's how it is. Um, 
And also for many years, um, because of ADA, like online businesses have argued that they can't be considered um, a place of public accommodation. That's like language from the ADA. Um, if they're not connected to a physical location, they're not subject to it. Um, this is a concept that's called nexus. And um, I think it might not be considered a good excuse anymore um, because there is a new act that's being introduced right now by my very favorite, Tammy Duckworth. She's the best. And also uh, uh, Representative John Serbenis. Um, and it's called, it's a, it's a mouthful. It's called the Website and Software Applications Accessibility Act Bill. Um, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but I think what's really cool about this is that um, it's kind of just taking that idea of Nexus out of the equation. Uh, you know, business sites and applications need to be accessible, period. End of story. Um, that's how it is. And there's also going to be some, um, I think, some additional funding that's going to go to small businesses um, to give them resources to make their websites compliant. Um, I really hope this passes. I'm really excited about it. Um, but because it also means that there's going to be a lot of accessibility design jobs out there if this is uh, if this is written out. So um, put it on your resume, learn about web accessibility. It'll help you get a job, I promise. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're going to walk through some examples. And in these examples, we're going to learn um, about some of the important uh, WCAG requirements um, for designing for accessibility. This by no means like touches all of them. This is kind of like some very high level ones. Um, I was I was a little short on time, so I had a whole section for captions, but just didn't have time for it. But there is a ton more than what I'm going to present here. Um, but in our first kind of scenario, let's imagine that we are a, a UX designer working on Target's website team. Um, you've been told uh, by your customer service team that they've received several help desk tickets that um, some users cannot use screen readers to navigate and use Target's website. So a screen reader is what we saw in that first video. Um, and there's a bunch of different kinds, um, you know, for... Uh, Mac and iPhone, there's a uh, voiceover. Um, for PC, there's uh, JAWS. And then if you have an Android phone, um, it's called TalkBack. But it's essentially, they all have the same function of, um, you know, just uh, reading the content of a web page uh, to a user um, so they can kind of navigate and use the website is kind of what the whole purpose of them are. So. You're tasked with creating some design solutions that resolve some of these issues uh, that are reported by the Target's customer service team. So like any good designer, um, you'll start off by trying to understand the user and their goals. Um, you review some of the tickets that have come in and um, you got pretty lucky because uh, there is one user, Rachel, who is legally blind, um, who said that they would be open to discussing the issues further. Um, so you set up some time with them to learn more about their pain points. So I'm going to demo for you uh, the issues that Rachel was um, experiencing. Hold on a second. Actually, let me make sure I am actually sharing my, I have to share my whole desktop for you guys to see what is going on here. Okay, you guys can see my slides? Yeah, okay. Um, let's get started. So we are on Target's website and what Rachel was, uh, her flow was essentially just um, after turning on her screen reader, um, she just searched for, um, she was looking for um, some high protein yogurt and she wanted to make sure that she her purchase, uh, whatever she bought had a certain amount of protein in it. So she needed to be able to search for a product and then go in and see the um, like what the nutritional content was. Um, so I'm going to enable voiceover and hopefully you guys can uh, see what's going on here. Um, 
Accessibility shortcuts. VoiceOver, checked. VoiceOver on Firefox, target, expect more. My store bullet closes at 10 p.m. Oak, link, registry. Visited, link, weekly ad. Link, red card. Link, target circle. Visited, link, find stores. Visited, link, target home. Net, collapsed, link, categories. Collapsed, link, deals. Collapsed, link, what's new. Collapsed, link, pickup and delivery. You are currently on a group inside of web content. To exit this group, press control option shift up arrow. High protein yo heading high protein yogurt. Picking up in store same day delivery scheduled contactless delivery shipping free with red card or $35 order star button link exclude filters menu zero applied button category button price button sold by button yogurt style button brand button type button flavor button dietary needs button. Visited link image colon ratio protein strawberry Greek yogurt 5.3 ounces heading level loading please wait you are currently on a heading level one inside of web content to exit this weather okay I want to stop for just a second um so first Rachel thought maybe she could get this information about like the protein content of this product by um uh maybe there's some like embedded descriptions in the images so Let's see if we were, if Rachel was successful doing that. View product image one of 12 slides button. You view product image two of 12 slides button. You are play product video 11 of 12 slides button. View product image three of 12 slides button. You are view product image four of 12 slides button. You are currently on a button inside of web content. Okay. So th that was extremely unhelpful. Um, the screen reader was only able to read the descriptions, which were, you know, one of, you know, nine products, not very helpful. Um, as a sighted person, you know, how you would usually go about this task is looking at the Zoom. Zoom. US, the Zoom share to our window system dialogue, and you may button view US has new system voice over us to return to the meeting controls. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what just happened there, but let's start over. Um, I'll just enable this actually. Voice over on Firefox, colon ratio protein strawberry Greek yogurt, 5.3 ounces. Okay, so what she was trying to do next was um, maybe it was later, this information is on the web page, but just kind of maybe below. So um, instead of kind of like tapping through every single thing, she was looking for um, using like the headings menu um, that's available through her screen reader to see um, where on the page it would be. So you can do that by hitting control option U. Headings menu. You are currently in a voiceover menu. This is a list of voiceover menu options. To navigate up and down the list, use the arrow keys. To choose a menu item, press return. To close the menu, press escape. So um, as you can see here, there are some headings, um, but they are out of order. So that was a frustrating pain point for her because usually it should be heading one, heading two, heading three, and so on, so that she could understand kind of the structuring and the hierarchy of information. But, um, you know, we have heading one, which was like the product title, and then we have heading four. Carmen with Shufford to everyone. Sorry, I joined late. Will you be sharing this webinar recording? Okay, that's interesting. Um, but Carmen Shufford to everyone. Sorry. Can we hold off on doing chat um, while the voiceover is on? Uh, but anyways, um, she was trying to have like figure out like where this information would be um, and eventually thought maybe it would be under um, the about this item heading. So um, let's heading see. level heading level four, heading level heading level heading level three shipping heading level three out of stock heading level two about this item. All right. Heading level two about this item. You are currently on a heading level link. Details, one of four, selected, list four items. Link, label info, two of four. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control, option, space. Okay. Maybe it's there, maybe it's there. Loading, please wait. You are currently on a link. Okay. To click this link, press control, option, space. Link, label info, two of four, selected. Link, shipping and returns, three of four. Link, Q&A, four of four, 150 G, one. Heading level four, three items, amount, amount per serving, amount, 170. Percent daily value star G five percent five percent G eight percent eight percent G MG four percent four percent MG eight percent. Okay, so as we can see, that um, I'll go ahead and disable 
voiceover right now because we're done with it. Um, voiceover off. Uh, but as you can see, it was only reading the amounts, but actually not the nutrients. So there's no way for Rachel to know like what, um, you know, how much protein content that this product um, had. Uh, so that's unfortunate for her and, and for Target as well. Um, so to get into like what, um, what we could do to fix this, um, in this first, um, guideline that, that could have been followed to help Rachel, um, is this idea of alt text. Um, and so with alt text, kind of the goal is to embed images with a short description, um, so someone who's using a screen reader can understand what the image is of. So it includes people um, who are using screen readers so they can understand what's on the page. When you're writing alt text, um, it's, uh, it's important to really think about like and describe what is happening in the image and how is it relevant to what you're trying to communicate. Um, this is relevant. Is this is required for images, but also static maps, illustrations, figures, and icons. So this uh, this image had a description on the website. Uh, you know, it's within an alt tag, and it just said "product image one of twelve slides." That's not very helpful. If I were to rewrite this um, image description, I would maybe rewrite it as "front of." Uh, front of product, and then ratio protein, 25 grams, um, strawberry, three grams sugar, 5.3 ounces. So all the text that's on the front of this image would be accessible um, by uh, the screen reader reading the alt text from the image. Okay, so we're gonna do a little activity right now. Um, and essentially um, we're, gonna write a user story. So if you're not all familiar with a user story, that's okay. Um, but uh, this is something employed by many like companies in general um, that you know build digital products. And the goal is to translate a user's needs into like development work that's gonna be worked on. So it's usually structured starting with like the type of user. So here as a target user, um, and the next blank is what the user um, could be their goal. It could also just be like an action um, that they're or a task they're trying to accomplish. And then the second blank is the benefit. What are they going to get out of it? Um, that kind of thing. So this is and should always be a collaborative team activity. Um, designers, engineers, and products should always be participating in this activity. Um, so there's a clear understanding of the work um, that needs to be done and what the outcome should be. So I was thinking we could write a user story for Rachel um, so that the developers at Target can fix this issue. Um, so I am I did the first part for you guys. So, um, and then I'm thinking we can maybe do the second part together. So as a Target user, I want to read image descriptions on product pages. And so what I would like you guys to do in um, to complete the second part of the sentence is in the chat, go ahead and put what is the benefit that Rachel is going to get out of it? What is she going to be able to do if we include image descriptions on these uh, product images? So go ahead and just, um, you can throw, throw anything in there. It can be super obvious, can be a little out there, whatever you think. Yeah, accurately order a product, make better decisions. Yeah, yeah, because she was trying to, you know, find it something specific about a product um, that met her needs. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's see, yeah, pick a shirt in your favorite color, you know, best choose what I need. That's great. Love that. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, that is um, really awesome and what we're trying to get at here. Okay, okay. Next, um, if you, uh, kind of the next problem that Rachel experienced was, remember how she kind of like couldn't find 
label information in the headings menu and she had to kind of guess and she, it was kind of out of order for her, wasn't really super easy to find. Um, so much like how, you know, a sighted person would, uh, you know, skim a page kind of left to right, top to bottom, um, people using screen readers use that headings menu to find content that they're looking for so they don't have to read through every single thing in order to find what they need. So the way the content is structured um, on a web page using like basic HTML, this is kind of like beginning of the internet kind of stuff. Um, maybe you all wrote HTML when you had MySpace pages uh, back in the day, but um, the way that the content is structured in HTML has not really changed much since the beginning of the internet. Um, in this image right here, we have an example of um, some HTML elements and how they might be structured. So you have a header and a nav at the top. You have your main content. There isn't a side if you have like some like tertiary information. And then at the bottom, you would have a footer. Um, and if you remember how it wasn't reading like the nutrient labels, um, that's because uh, uh, that part of the web page was actually using something called a div. And so a div is essentially like uh, an HTML element that's like a very generic container. Um, and you can kind of, you could build a whole website using a div, but um, it's not the right way to do it because uh, divs don't communicate any information to the screen reader. They don't tell the user that they're on a navigation element or they're on the footer, that kind of thing. So uh, using HTML elements and correct HTML markup includes people um, uh, who are, you know, using the internet so they can easily navigate that content. Um, there's also headings, uh, proper headings. So heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four. That stuff should be structured by kind of the, um, the you know, by hierarchy, essentially. You know, you have your text uh, for an H1 bigger than you have for an H3. And that's how your content should be structured um, semantically on, on an HTML. Now, this is something that's more on the front end development side, but I think something that we can do to um, collaborate with developers on our team to make sure that this is uh, marked up uh, correctly is like, this is doesn't look very nice. I, I'll give you that. But like, if you can kind of show how the page should be structured from a hierarchy perspective, and um, break it up in squares and then document like, this should be an H1. We should add an H2 here. You know, we need to add like, um, I would also recommend under like the about this item part, we should be adding like a H3 that said nutritional info. So it would show up in that headings menu um, a lot easier for um, someone using a screen reader. Um, I also have, you can also do this in a, just a, a doc example, if you feel more comfortable writing some like basic HTML, I won't go through this all, but that could also help communicate um, what needs to be done to your development team. Um, okay, I realize I am like really short on time. Um, and so I'm going to kind of like brush through uh, a couple things, but um, essentially, um, I'm going to skip through this last one, actually. Um, I'm going to actually stop sharing. Uh, I just wanted to call out that, um, you know, you could have, you know, something that could have happened was um, you shared this feedback to your team, including um, three back-end, two front-end engineers, and a product manager. Uh, they come back to you and they say, this is way too much work um, to update everything, especially just for a couple of users. So this is likely what happened in 2008. Um, Target actually did get sued for these issues. Um, you know, not screen reader accessible, didn't have alt images, wasn't using HTML correctly. Um, and they actually ended up having to pay $6 million in damages um, to the National Federation of the Blind. Um, and they also covered like $3 billion of, of their uh, legal fees as well. So, you know, because Target got used 
uh, sued for it, um, we can assume that kind of earlier when they got this feedback um, from some users about things not being accessible, um, they probably ignored it. And that's what usually happens. Um, users usually give companies a chance to fix these issues. And if you can prove that you're, you've dedicated um, resources and uh, time and money to fixing these issues, you're you're most likely going to be good for accessibility um, from accessibility lawsuits, but they ignored it and they ended up having to really pay for it from that. So if we could go back in time and um, kind of like, you know, fix their problem, you know, maybe instead of like the designer walking away in defeat, um, they maybe met with their product manager in a one on one after this meeting. Um, to explain that, like, you know, this is going to potentially open up our business to lawsuits in both the U.S. and Canada, um, and the number of accessibility lawsuits has skyrocketed. Um, it's usually more compelling from a business perspective instead of, like, this won't be accessible to our blind users. I wish everyone cared, like, enough to just say, oh, it's not accessible to blind users, let's fix it, but that's the business case, is we're going to we're gonna eventually get sued for this. So it's super easy to add alt text to images. We should just start doing this so that we're, we're gonna have our, you know, so that we're gonna be covered. Okay. I'm going to move on to this last example. Um, so moving away from Target, um, we're now um, a designer for the New Century Chamber Orchestra, and um, your team recently shipped a new website feature that lets users sign up for um, a newsletter so they can be notified about upcoming events and, uh, you know, concerts and, and things like that. Normally, when new features ship, you do some sort of design sign off, but you were out of office on vacation, so they just kind of shipped it without giving a good uh, design sign off on it. And unfortunately, right after it went live, um, your team gets a complaint from a user named Ron um, that said, like, he can't sign up for emails. And let me show you what he shared um, in his voicemail. Um, he asked if generally there was a way to sign up to be notified uh, for events and concerts. And um, he was directed to this feature that is at the bottom of the page um, that he didn't even really notice because he is colorblind. Um, and because the text is so light here on the screen um, and it's pretty small too, it was really difficult for him to read um, what it was saying also in some of these inputs, um, you know, first name, last name, email address, you couldn't even, you couldn't even tell what he was supposed to enter there. Um, after he did try and use it, um, you know, he left out one of these things and then he got this error message, but because he's blind, he did not see it. Um, and it kind of just looked like the page was broken because things kind of like shifted down a little bit. Um, and he kind of just gave up which really sucks. Um, so after you you learn all that information um, and uh, you sit down with a developer on your team and you try and investigate like and document every single thing that needs to be fixed here. So um, what you can do, you can do this in the browser. Um, spe specifically wanted to use uh, Firefox here because be they have some great accessibility features, but you can essentially just like right click anywhere on the page and you can see this inspect option. And then we've got uh, this bottom pane here um, and there is an accessibility tab. So uh, under here, there is a drop down to simulate and we can actually see what uh, Ron is seeing. So he has the type of color blindness, uh, protonopia, where he can't see red. So if we turn that on, we can actually simulate um, Ron's experience. So as you can see here, the, uh, the background got even lighter. It's even more difficult to read the text. And the, um, the error message, message is, 
is just gray and, and not red. So it was very easy to miss that um, he had to do something um, in here. Um, you can also check for issues under this uh, issues drop down. It'll check for contrast, uh, keyboard, and text labels. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just turn on all of these. And um, on here on the figure, uh, you can see that there's like some issues all over the page, actually, but we're just kind of concerned with this particular section. So I think, yeah, here we are. We've got some contrast issues, uh, missing text labels. Looks like there's also some keyboard issues here. And I think what is really, really cool about Mozilla is specifically with the, the color contrast, they will actually tell you what the color contrast is, and they will tell you when it doesn't meet WCAG standards. Um, and they even provide a link that you can click, um, and it actually opens up their developer's documentation. So this here has the WCAG requirements that it's kind of just more like cut and dry, like this is exactly what is required um, for you know body text, um, and also user interface components. Um, there's even, they'll even link to some like potential solutions of some color contrast checkers that you can use. Um, and I think this is just like a great um, feature that they've, you know, you can really tell they've devoted themselves to accessibility um, and they make it really easy, especially for like a developer to like resolve, figure out what the problem is and kind of learn more. So after you've documented everything, you kind of need to figure out like, okay, well, what, what should the colors be? How should this actually look? Um, and so I usually kind of create like a little checklist of, of how to document this. So first, like just show what the current state is, um, annotate what the every single issue, issue is you need to fix, uh, what the requirement is, and then expected state, what the new design should be. This really makes it very clear for um, developers to know exactly what they need to fix. Um, some things as a designer you kind of think are really obvious um, of you know the difference between these two things, but sometimes developers don't really notice those things unless you really document it out for them. So, um, so this is the current state. I would start with that first and then to show the issues, um, I would do an annotation like this. So it's like, really every single issue that needs to be fixed, what the issue is and like what the requirement is. So we've got color contrast text. The ratio between text and the background needs to be a ratio of 4.5 to one. Um, with, uh, there are some issues with the UI, like the buttons. Um, they also have a contrast requirement. It's a little less, it's just three to one. Um, and again, this is like the color of the background and the UI element and the text. There's also the issue of form fields. Um, they're using placeholder text as a label for the input. And you should really never do this even just from a UX perspective. There's like a lot of annoying things that can happen of like, if you've got autofill in your browser, it'll like replace like what it is. And then you like forget what you're supposed to put in there. And it can be really frustrating. But if um, also with a screen reader, if there's no label, the screen reader is not going to read anything to the person using the screen reader. It's just going to be a blank thing. So they're not going to know what they're supposed to put in um, either. And then lastly, there's um, the rule of using only color to communicate. Um, so here we do have that it's like red and it does say email address is required, but using an additional element like um, uh, like an icon or pattern or maybe different line quality or thickness or boldness, um, in addition to color, uh, especially when you are communicating things like error states or things that the user needs to do to move forward is really important. So. Um, I actually am going to show how you could fix the color contrast issue right in Figma. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Figma. It's the design tool I use, um, but they have a lot of great plugins and tools. So I'm going to show um, this one that I like to use. So here on the right, we've got a window 
that says ally contrast checker. And essentially all you have to do is select your frame that your design is in and then hit this check button. And then it'll show you all the errors, all the color contrast errors that are showing up here. So for every single thing, it will show you if it um, you know, qualifies for AA or AAA. Uh, right now we'll just be focused on AA right now. Um, and you can basically just adjust the color and it'll show you when you've met the contrast standard. So this first one looks like, I'll zoom in a little bit too. Um, it looks like this, uh, this input uh, placeholder is not good. So we can just hit the slider and then look, we're good. Um, next with like the buttons, it looks like the white text and that magenta color is not good. Um, and so you can also, we're gonna make the background a little darker for this case. And look, I barely even had to touch it and it was fine. It was just barely off the mark. Uh, we can do, this icon right here. So we can make this text a little darker. Oh, that wasn't even very hard at all. And then like maybe lastly, we can do uh, this, uh, this text right here. I feel like this one is the worst one, the most difficult to see. We can just make the text darker. Oh, I think it did it to this one. Oh, it did it to this one, yeah. Um, there we go. Um, so it's much easier to see. So that's a really great tool that you can use to just also do it right in your browser. Um, in the resource doc, I also link to some contrast checkers that um, you can just use in the browser, like if you don't use Figma, um, that are also very helpful. Okay. Um, so this is kind of like how I would design this, uh, what the expected state should be. So. Uh, as you can see, our text is darker. Um, the air state that I designed on here is um, a really thick red, darker red outline. Also using an icon and putting the email or the um, error message below. Um, so it's clear. Um, changed some of the button colors and made the button text a little bigger. Um, just so it's also just easier to see. Made some of the text bigger as well. Um, and also added, um, you've seen like a little red asterisk sometimes on required fields and forms so that the user knows that they have to enter it and they don't skip over it and hopefully they don't get the error state, that kind of thing. Um, and then lastly, I would also do, um, cause a developer would probably fix these issues at like the individual component level. So what I mean by component, like at, you know, they would fix like all the buttons, all the inputs, all that stuff at once. So um, you can just kind of do a side-by-side -side comparison and just call out exactly what the change is. So like, is it a color change and increase in size? Um, you know, are we doing something else like moving the label above or below things? How are we changing the, the error states? Um, that kind of thing, just so there's like literally no excuse for things to not be correct um, this time around. All right, I think that's it. That's all I got for you guys. Um, I will go ahead and drop the link to this document in um, in the chat. Um, it's got some resources that I've used in this presentation, um, some some people to follow to learn more about um, the disability community, a little bit about WCAG guidelines some, I love looking up accessibility lawsuits because it's like the hot gossip um, about <laughs> what's out there. That's really fun. And some other tools and resources that you can, um, that you can use. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just drop that in, but I think if anyone has any questions. Got a question for you. Uh-huh. Uh, so you're talking about these uh, laws and how web accessibility is written law, and we have an hour recording of multiple, in one case, a large corporation who's been sued before, still mm -hmm. being inaccessible. Mm -hmm. And I know you said that there's a, like, fine line between, like, they have to show, like, good faith effort. Is there mm -hmm. any, like, 
what's the criteria for that? Um, I think it's just like, you have to show that you have allocated, um, like budget, I think would be one way to show it, uh, resources and time you can show, like a company could show like their roadmap, you know, items that are going towards accessibility, um, to kind of like prove that it's being worked on. I'm not going to say like all the time that's going to be enough, but I think, if you just listen to your users and aren't a jerk and just ignore them, like that's what they want. They want you to fix the issue. They don't want to go to court. They don't want to go through all this stuff. Um, but they will if, you know, if it means that they can actually start using your website. Thank you. It's yeah. Question in the chat for you as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, curious about what is the intersection between usability and accessibility? So, um, things can be accessible, or even if you think about, um, generally like providing accommodation, that's like a big thing that's kind of within, even outside of web accessibility, but, you know, in public spaces, you know, you've got to provide accommodation also in like the academic setting. Um, we've got to provide accommodation for our students. Um, but just because you're providing that accommodation doesn't mean you're making things usable for them or easy, easy for them. You know, um, providing an, an accommodation is often a, like a checkbox kind of thing um, and saying like, you have, you know, confirm that we provided this accommodation for you so that like our part is covered. But a lot of times um, these companies aren't really thinking about like what the users need to do um, and what their end-to-end -end flow is. It's kind of like, how can I fix this problem um, in as little effort as possible, but my I'm covered from a legal perspective. Let's see. Um, uh, when you collect user stories from client, how do you ensure diversity in your client group to obtain requirements? Um, or do you do a contextual study, obtain user stories from IWD? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by IWD, but like, this is honestly like something that I, like I'm not really sure, like the best way to like recruit like users for um, like usability studies or, or user interviews. I think the best way to go about this is a user interview kind of scenario um, as opposed to trying to like work uh, like within your organization. Um, Cause really you just wanna understand, um, you know, what these users are trying to do, what their end goal is, how are they using assistive technology to complete their goals and like where are those roadblocks in the middle? So including them in your user research studies, um, in, uh, you know, it may be some like beta testing programs um, would also be a good way to do this. Um, and if you are working with like a company that recruits users for that, I would just include um, some of that criteria in like when you screen for users that you're gonna meet with, that kind of thing. Um, I have also heard of some, um, some companies also having like an internal kind of advisory group um, of people that work there that that have disabilities um, to be included in some of the early design work. Um, this is something that they're paid for and not asked to do in addition to their you know regular role. You shouldn't just ask somebody um, who's just able to do that um, for for no money or or resources. But um, that's something new that I've seen in the market as well. Um, but a lot of a lot of companies are not doing it and we're kind of all trying to figure it out um, together. But that's kind of an area I'm looking to grow in myself for sure. There was something from Kristen. Uh, my school district is trying to distinguish between a compliance level of accessibility and a service level of accessibility. And I'm not sure what that means. Um, 
I thought your explanation of accessibility as compliance and usability as service was really helpful. So I mm -hmm. appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's something I think is really interesting too when you have a service, especially like in the government space where, you know, people are using, um, like they're using a website in certain phases of their process, but then there's also the physical environment that you have to account for and kind of thinking of that like end-to-end -end kind of flow holistically. Um, I'm sure it's very challenging, but seems like a super interesting um, design problem um, that, that has a lot of complexity to it for sure. All right. Excellent. I'll uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, Julia, uh, it's been a pleasure. And mm -hmm. we really appreciate you sharing your expertise on this. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Um, let me just a second. I forgot to drop in that uh, link to those resources in the chat. Here it is. My email address is um, is linked in there. Also, I'll also add my like LinkedIn if anyone has any questions or wants to chat about really anything in general, doesn't even matter what it is really. Um, just give me, give me a shout. I'm always happy to chat.